I would just say that on that point, that the crucial variable was whether or not Hezbollah would continue on the course it had set, which was we're going to target northern Israel and further unless there is a ceasefire in Gaza. And I wasn't sure whether they would persist in that course or look to the long term and let the Israeli forces into Lebanon and engage in a guerrilla war as they did from 1978 to 2000. In other words, whether Hezbollah was going to adopt a very long-term strategy or it was going to uh, settle some scores right now. Uh, I've said all along that the Hezbollah strategy was quite obvious uh, because we've seen it in action, not only in Lebanon, but we also saw it in action in Hamas, excuse me, in Gaza with Hamas. And the strategy basically is not to let Israel declare victory. So each time Israel uh, commits its massive atrocities and believes it's now won the war, there is a reaction. And the reaction has always been the firing of the rockets, either from South Lebanon or from Gaza, so as to deny Israel the ability to declare victory. And then it's always left with only one choice. If you want to take out the Hamas or the Hezbollah rocket attacks, you have to invade. And uh, it seems Hezbollah is still set on forcing Israel to carry out a real invasion. What they're doing now is basically a photo op. Uh, same thing as they did in 2006. In 2006, they mobilized the troops. The troops were on the border. They kept saying, we're going to invade, we're going to invade, we're going to invade. And inside, they're thinking, we don't want to invade, we don't want to invade, because they knew what was going to happen. It was going to be a, a, a catastrophe for them. And then when it was clear that Hezbollah wouldn't stop firing the rockets, uh, Israel had only two options, to invade or, as it did, to beg the United States to put through in the Security Council a ceasefire resolution. So Israel was, quote unquote, forced to end its uh, attack on Lebanon. Uh, and the same thing is true today. Uh, if Hezbollah keeps up the attacks on northern Israel and targets as far as Tel Aviv, then Netanyahu will not be able to declare victory. And as a consequence, the pressure is going to build on him. He's got to invade. He's got to launch the invasion. And then he'll have a choice. Have the United States come in, save his scalp by imposing a ceasefire resolution or invading. What they did in 2006 was they uh, got their ceasefire, they imposed a ceasefire resolution via Condoleezza Rice, and then they technically invaded, which is they sent in their troops all the way to the Latani so they can claim victory, and then the troops withdrew because there was a ceasefire. Um, so as of now, based on what Muin said, as of now, I believe that they're going to continue on the strategy of denying Netanyahu the ability to declare a victory and then forcing on him the decision of either asking the U.S. to bail him out with a ceasefire resolution or carrying out the ground invasion. As to the bigger picture, where I feel more confident, the two obvious analogies are 1967 and uh, the Gulf invasion of 2003. And Netanyahu wants to pull off a 1967. We have to remember that 1967 sounded the death knell of what was called back then radical Arab nationalism. It inflicted uh, a... Uh, 
it inflicted a, I don't want to say devastating, it inflicted a major defeat on Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. And that was the end of radical Arab nationalism. Now he's hoping what replaced the radical Arab nationalism, it looked like Israel won, everything was over. Uh, what replaced it, of course, was uh, radical Islamic fundamentalism with the Iranian Revolution in 1979. And since 1979, they've had to deal with this new problem. Uh, now it's crystallized in the axis of resistance. And they're hoping to do to the axis of resistance what it did in 1967. Uh, so he can you know, be the second, the second great Israeli victory up to 67, and Mr. Netanyahu can take credit for it. And the other obvious analogy is 2003, where uh, after 9-11, uh, the United States was figuring out what, what it can get from 9-11. What can it squeeze out of 9-11? And it was scanning the maps, trying to figure out which country to bomb. Uh, literally, if you read the accounts, they finally decide Afghanistan. When it came to Iraq, it was actually a split between the U.S. and Israel because Israel wanted Iran first. Israel didn't very much care about Iraq. Uh, the U.S. wanted Iraq first. And then the assumption was uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and then Iran. Uh, that didn't happen, obviously, because mission accomplished turned into mission disaster. Uh, and now they're doing the same thing, Israel. Gaza, Hezbollah, Iran. Uh, that's the sequence. Those are the dominoes. And they seem to believe that they can pull it off. I want to ask, uh, pick up um, one point from what Muin and Norm um, uh, actually spoke about, and uh, Muin can respond, and also can you can respond to what Norm just said. I, I wanted to wanted you to declutter a little bit about the objective of this escalation, and I think there are two things that are being talked about now. One, as you said, is delinking the resistance in Gaza from the support that Hezbollah offers by uh, firing the rockets. And the other is a sort of internal mm, war of narrative where Netanyahu's own image has been under question since the failure of security during October 7. Um, and these are often discussed in media as two objectives. So can you comment on these two objectives uh, and whatever you would like to comment on what Norm just said. Well, first of all, on um, Netanyahu's, let's say, uh, personal agenda, if I can put it that way. And again, I think his personal agenda is only part of a much broader picture. Um, many people have noted that Netanyahu, with this talk of total victory and so on, um, clearly has a Churchill complex. Um, but yesterday I was reading an interview in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz with a uh, former senior Israeli military officer and government official, Giora Island, who may be known to you because he is the one who has consistently been advocating mass starvation um, in the Gaza Strip and, and, and creating conditions to produce epidemic disease and so on. Um, he made one point which which I thought is worth considering, and he said... Um, the issue with Netanyahu is not a Churchill complex, but an FDR complex, in the sense that um, FDR was in charge of the U.S. ship of state um, on the 7th of December, 1941, Pearl Harbor. But he is remembered not for his failures um, at Pearl Harbor, but rather for leading um, the United States to uh, the brink of victory during the Second World War um, shortly uh, before he died. And that, in Ireland's view, um, uh, Netanyahu is determined to prolong this war and to um, seek to achieve a meaningful, uh, if not decisive victory, so that at the end of the day, when the history books are written, um, and uh, more importantly, when the commissions of inquiry 
and so on uh, are put into place that Netanyahu can offset his historic failure on the 7th of October 2023 with um, uh, whatever achievements he's now trying to achieve. Now, th that's the personal agenda. I think in the broader picture, many people have noted that Israel has failed to develop a strategy in the sense that its response to the 7th of October has been a maniacal genocidal campaign um, against uh, the Gaza Strip to make it unfit for human habitation, just sowing death and destruction on a massive scale, but motivated primarily by revenge and bloodlust, uninformed by a persuasive political vision over what Israel hopes to um, uh, achieve. I think that is no longer the case. I think Israel now has is, has developed a much clearer strategy, particularly in, in the last month or two, where it now has a clear political objective of dismantling the axis of resistance, um, of, as we were saying earlier, um, delinking um, uh, de Lebanon and also Yemen and others from uh, the Gaza Strip and taking apart this coalition piece by piece um, in order to have a decisive turning point in the history of the region, much like um, 1967, as, as, as Norm was just pointing out. So I think the real question is, are we now heading towards another 1967 or another 2003? And um, on the evidence, um, we have Israeli failure in the Gaza Strip. Um, in Lebanon, I don't think there are many people who expect that Hezbollah and its capabilities have been sufficiently weakened to an extent that Israel can decisively um, defeat it, because I think another problem for Israel is its military is a very effective killing machine, um, uh, but not particularly, um, uh, it, it's quite mediocre when it comes to the actual fighting capabilities, particularly of its infantry and ground operations in um, urban combat. So um, ultimately, I think the issue is that the U.S. is now fully on board with the Israeli agenda. It's probably fair to say that for much of the past year, the U.S. was willingly endorsing and supplying um, and enabling everything Israel was doing, even if it was not always convinced by what Israel was doing. It just chose to support rather than um, oppose it. But I think we've now reached a juncture where the U.S. is fully on board with the Israeli agenda because the one red line for the United States is there can be no defeat of Israel. Israel cannot, um, if, if, if it's not going to succeed, um, it can not uh, be um, uh, defeated. And, and particularly with this U.S. administration, which even um, by comparison with its predecessors has taken its unconditional um, uh, support and participation in Israel's agenda to unprecedented heights, I think this puts us in a situation where between now and January 2025, when Biden leaves um, the White House, uh, puts not only the region, but arguably the world in an extremely, extremely dangerous place. Oh, I want to first address what Moeen said, and then I'll move on to the U.S. Um, I do believe that Israel had a clear objective after October, after October 7th. And the clear objective was to once and for all put an end to the Gaza question. We're not going, what they call this war of attrition. They said, what you know, they're mowings of the lawn. Uh, they said that the next war, and this was said in 2015, the next war, they were tired of the wars of attrition. The next war would be the last war. And so the objective, in my opinion, was clear. The question was, what strategy? And the strategy had basically three possibilities. Um, one, to expel the population. Two, 
to make Gaza uninhabitable, or three, to an outright genocide. Three, or all of the above. <laughs> well, three wasn't uh, an outright genocide in the sense of, as the Minister of Antiquities put it, to nuke Gaza. Um, that was not a possibility because of PR. You know, that's crude, but that's actually the fact. Um, the expulsion, uh, at least again, on the mass was not a possibility because President Sisi in Egypt, apparently acquiesced to by the United States, said no. And so the middle option was the main option, though, as Mouin said, uh, they overlap. It's not as if they're discrete options and one precludes the other. They overlap. And they chose the middle option. They, they were forced into the middle option. And here, there's some disagreement between Mouin and I. I think they succeeded. I think Gaza is and will for the foreseeable future, uh, certainly the next 10 to 15 years, it will be uninhabitable. We have to remember that in as of October 6, Gaza had not yet even rebuilt from 2006. Uh, excuse me, from 2014. Gaza, I think it was, I can't remember if it was 75% uh, or 90%, somewhere between there, it had rebuilt from 2016. So they hadn't even cleared away the rubble and replaced 2016 operation. Uh oh, my memory. 2014. 2014. I'm very tired. They hadn't uh, even uh, replaced the destruction from 2014. And in 2014, there were 2.5 million tons of rubble. This, uh, this time, as of now, the estimate is 45 million tons of rubble. So I think they have achieved that goal of solving the Gaza question. Now, uh, the, the, Israel is a creature, I guess most countries are, they're creatures of opportunity. And a new opportunity opened up when Hezbollah started to fire in northern Israel. And the opportunity was, we can maybe use this occasion to also solve the Hezbollah question. It's probable that had Hezbollah not fired in northern Israel, they wouldn't have used this occasion to try to solve the Hezbollah question. But once that began, they began to patiently uh, figure out a strategy. And it seems they had in their desk drawer the prerequisites, namely, they can target and knock out significant members of the Hezbollah leadership up to and including the general secretary I myself, I won't go into it. I don't. I believe they always could have knocked out the general secretary, Mr. Nasrallah, but they chose not to for fear of the retaliatory uh, repercussions. I think this time, yes, its intelligence paid off for sure, but it has to also be remembered that Nasrallah didn't have to be in the Dahya and the Dahya was the most suicidal place to be since Israel had already been attacking it. And it's filled, it's replete with infiltrators, uh, you know, agents of the Israelis and the Americans and also the Lebanese. Um, he could have gone to one of the mountain redoubts. I've been to them. They have headquarters, their real command and control was obviously not the Daya. It was in these mountain, these uh, tunnels built deep inside mountains, which at the time, now I can't say I don't know anything about the military, they said could withstand an atomic bomb. It was quite deep in the ground. He could have gone there. Uh, and that's what surprised me when I first heard the reports. I said, no, that's not possible. He would be buried in the mountain. He would be here. High and then it occurred, of course, he didn't want to die a coward. Uh, and if all of his comrades were killed, he wasn't about to survive by burying himself deep inside the mountain. So I think 
its intelligence capabilities, yes, they're very good, stupid to dispute it, but there was a certain amount of confluence of interest between Israel taking out Mr. Nasrallah and Mr. Nasrallah unwilling to die like a coward. But now there was the prospect of taking out Hezbollah. And if you can sufficiently provoke Iran or force Iran to retaliate, so you attack Gaza, you attack Hezbollah, you attack Syria, you attack Yemen, it makes it impossible for Iran not to do anything. They've got to react. Uh, and so the expectation was that we can knock them all out. Uh, so I think the original stra the original objective was there. It was pretty much limited to Gaza. Once our, our Hezbollah entered the picture, the objective increased to also using this opportunity to take out Hezbollah. Nasrallah understood that, but he was in an impossible dilemma. The impossible dilemma was if he did nothing while there was a genocide unfolding in Gaza, uh, it would completely discredit Hezbollah. But he also knew if they weren't ready for that confrontation with Israel, so they couldn't go in, so to speak, big. So he tried to carve out a middle course, the occasional bombing of northern Israel, the disruption of North, life in northern Israel. It didn't work. There was no middle course. I didn't believe, and I said it at the time, that Israel would ever accept uh, Hezbollah's uh, projectile attacks in northern Israel and would react. Uh, so I, I, I think that one has to look at it three levels. I think there was an objective. I think that the strategy eventually crystallized on that middle option of making Gaza uninhabitable. And then there was the escalating strategy as new opportunities opened up, in particular now having grounds for dismantling Hezbollah. As for the United Can States... Yeah, please. Sorry, go ahead. No, just uh, on the United you know, maybe, States. Maybe Muin can just respond to this and then we can come to the uh, U.S. Well, question. I, I just want to make one point because um, Norm put forward uh, the, the suggestion that Israel has, in fact, for a quite long time, had the capability to assassinate uh, Hassan Nasrallah. Um, but chose not to do so out of fear for the repercussions. Um, whether whether that's um, in fact the case or not, I don't know. It may well be. But what I think is also important to note is that it wouldn't have been an exclusively Israeli decision um, to go forward with such an assassination. I think um, if it was indeed the case that Israel had previous opportunities, it was not only an Israeli fear of the repercussions that prevented it from doing so, but also an American veto. There's some evidence that the Americans have in the past um, uh, warned Israel off such a course because they were concerned not only about um, the response to Israel, but also the response to the U.S. position in the Middle East, because I think the Americans concluded quite rightly that any such action would be seen as a joint U.S.-Israeli um, attack. Hi, my name is Ayushman. I, along with Jyotisman, have started this platform. In the last two years, we have tried to build content for the left and progressive forces. We have interviewed economists, historians, political commentators, and activists so far. If you have liked our content, so far and want us to build an archive for the left i have two requests for you please do consider donating for the cause link is in the description below also if you are not able to do so don't feel sad you can always like our videos and share 
our videos to your comrades finally don't forget to hit the subscribe button